Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. ASA is one of those fantastic organisations that works very hard to promote animal studies and to support animal studies scholars. And in fact, my guest on the episode this week was on the ASA committee with me for quite a while. So ASA is a really good organisation. I would really like to encourage you to think about becoming a member. I'm a member. Member is just 50 Australian dollars for the waged and even less for those who are unwaged. So think about joining ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Well, I am here in glorious Hobart Town on the lovely island of Tasmania which is part of Australia, but it's a little island. And I am sitting in the lounge room of one Dr. Yvette Watt. Now, Yvette is a lecturer in painting and drawing at the University of Tasmania. And this week, I'm going to speak to Yvette about her art project, Duck Lake. Now, before listening to this episode, I encourage everyone to go and have a look at the Duck Lake video. It's available on YouTube. So if you just put Duck Lake into YouTube or Google more generally, it will come up. It's a really amazing artwork. And um, that will help give context to this episode. But nonetheless, welcome to the podcast, Yvette. Thanks, Siobhan. Can I just say very quickly, you'll need to put in Duck Lake Project or you'll come up some very unrelated things. Oh, okay. Good tip. Duck Lake Project. Yes. So, Yvette, what inspired you to do this? Uh, Well, I've been going to the opening of duck shooting season um, in Tasmania since 2003. Um, And there were a few years, I think it was about three years in a row, where for various reasons I wasn't able to get up there. And so I think it must have been 2014 um, when I went. I was really concerned at how few duck rescuers there were there. Um, It's always an issue trying to get media because it's quite remote and increasingly, of course, media has very little money um, to cover anything other than the really big issues. And for some years I'd had this crazy idea in my head that I think had come around from, you know, just standing around the lagoon um, in the freezing cold um, and your mind just starting to wander. And the the place that we go to is called Malting Lagoon and it's called Malting Lagoon because um, the swans go there every year for their annual malt. So I don't know, something about swans, Swan Lake, the idea of these blokes in their camo shooting ducks you know the very kind of hyper masculine hyper masculine thing that goes on with duck shooting it all started to form in my mind which really was just this kind of mad fantasy the idea of holding a ballet um, based on Swan Lake on a floating stage in the lagoon Um, and that year I went you know what I think I'm going to do it it was it really was one of those things where I was, as soon as I started to talk about it and really start making it happen, I was slightly terrified at whether this was even achievable or not. But there was something in me that just felt driven to to, to try it. So I would love for you to describe for listeners the actual event on the day. But before we get to that, can you say something about what was involved in organising it, pulling it together, raising funds, conceptualising it, etc. Sure. Um, It was a really mammoth undertaking and um, one of the things I do have to say is that although I had the initial idea, in in many ways it wasn't just my project. In fact, it was impossible to do that project without the help of an incredible team of people. Um, I have to make special mention of a very good friend, also a really fabulous artist, fellow vegan and my right-hand woman, Christina Scott, 
She did everything from sewing the tutus to just being available, being there on site. She was incredible. Um, But there was a huge team of volunteers, both in terms of making the costumes and the props and things for the event, um, in doing the cooking. We had a crowdfunding campaign um, that raised $10,000 to fund the project and part of that involved getting uh, local artists to... Um, we gave each of them a template based on a kind of a, a, um, a wooden um, decoy and they were asked to decorate it and they were auctioned off to raise money and the support from the Tasmanian art community for that was incredible. Um, I think if you look at the credits on the, on the little documentary video that's about eight minutes long on YouTube, you'll see just how many people were involved in bringing the project to fruition. It was about 10 months' work. All up. So, can you ex- can you describe then the twenty four hours before you actually went live with the display or the dance? Goodness, I mean, it was a lot of stuff that we had to take from uh, Malting Lagoon is about two and a half to three hours um, north east of Hobart, so we had to cart an enormous amount of stuff up there. So there was a convoy of people bringing things up to the lagoon. Um, and that included all of the sp- all of the bits and pieces for making the stage, and that was designed and and made by a local builder, um, and also someone actually who studied at the art school, uh, Jed McNeil. There was uh, a marquee, huge amounts of food, all of the costumes, um, kayaks, the work. So first of all, there was just physically moving everything up to the lagoon. So we got up there pretty early on the Friday before uh, the season opens, very early on a Saturday morning. Um, At that point, we were fairly certain ABC TV were going to come, but we weren't 100% sure. So we were desperately hoping that that was the case and they were... They were pretty sure as well, but you just never know what's going to happen at the last minute, of course. Anything could happen in the news and so they sent off somebody somewhere else. Um, We had wanted to have the lagoon, sorry, have the stage floating on the lagoon. We had had an ongoing battle, or I had, with Parks and Wildlife who were refusing to give us permission to actually have the stage on the lagoon. They would only give us permission to put it in a car park um, some distance from the lagoon. Lagoon would be there as a backdrop, but quite some distance away. Um, everyone was set to go. We'd been rehearsing for weeks with the, the dancers. So everything was ready um, and it all went off. I have to say, everything went off without a hitch in that respect. By the time everybody went to bed on that Friday night, the stage was set up in the car park um, by the time I got up the next morning, the stage was in the lagoon. Nobody to this day is um, confessing as to who was involved in doing that. I have my suspicions, but um, I didn't know at that point what would happen. I didn't know whether Parks and Wildlife would shut us down. Um, they would always turn up early in the morning each year anyway. So what I was really hoping for was that we would be able to get some performances done on the stage on the lagoon while the media was there first before we got shut down. And what time was this? Uh, It was still dark. So the shooters are allowed to shoot ducks from an hour before dawn. I don't know how they can see them to shoot them because it is actually pitch black at that point. So it's about, it would have been about 5.30, 6am in March. Um, As it turns out, so we started actually performing in the dark. So fortunately we had a spotlight, a a, um, battery-powered spotlight that was really quite bright. And it was the most incredibly still morning. So the lagoon was like a mirror. So it was absolutely beautiful. And the dancers continued to perform over over some time um, with the media there filming. um, And with Parks and Wildlife and police standing around watching and apparently enjoying it. So for those who haven't looked at the video yet, could you describe the performance? Sure. There were um, there were half a dozen dancers. They were dressed in hot pink uh, tutus with hot pink camo leggings. 
Um, we had a branding thing going on, so we'd had our own T-shirts um, made up. So they had little black T-shirts with duck on the front. Um, and they performed a routine that was devised between the dancers, but with the guidance of, um, again, a volunteer. All of, Everybody was a volunteer in this. Nobody got paid. Um, a choreographer called Glenn Murray, a local choreographer, um, who's done a lot of work working with community groups. And Glenn did a fantastic job. It was a wonderful thing, actually, to see all of that unfold. So he didn't come up with a clear plan. They worked it out as they went along. So they performed this choreographed routine to a section of music from Duck Lake on on the stage. Um, and in the background is the Lagoon and the Hunter's Hides. Um, apart from those half a dozen dancers, there were, I don't know, I think there were a good 40 at least 40 duck rescuers all going out, also dressed in in the kind of the pink theme of that year, hot pink um, safety vests, pink camo leggings. Um, and they went out with hot pink um, flags and in kayaks all around the lagoon because the primary purpose of this was to draw attention to the issue through the media but also to stop ducks getting shot. That's a really important thing. And so having the team of duck rescuers out on the lagoon – was absolutely vital to this whole thing. And how did the shooters respond? You know, it was an interesting mix of responses. Um, a, we try not to have an obvious confrontation with the shooters. They stand in hides, so we're not having to stand right on the lagoon next to them, as happens, say, in a lot of the wetlands in Victoria. There was one shooter who... I um, actually found it incredibly entertaining um, and he was he was quite funny. I went out the second day after, you know, we'd done the performance on the Saturday morning. I went out on the Sunday morning just as a duck rescuer and just by, and he ended up setting up in, in camp with the rescuers um, and just getting on and doing his thing. So he was totally fine about it. And when I spoke to him the next morning, he wanted a photo with us. Um, but that first morning as we were packing up, we, um, there were about three of us. We were just putting the uh, pieces of the stage on the top of um, Jed's ute to move it out. And uh, two carloads of shooters from somewhere else completely on the lagoon came and blocked us in and they became incredibly aggressive. They knew my name. They addressed me by name. They got out of their car, made a point of having their guns with them. Um, and they started to become extremely argumentative, very nasty. So I had to leave two people there and there were still a couple of people coming in off the lagoon and fortunately the police were back at um, base camp so I was able to get the police come down and defuse the situation but that was probably the scariest moment. And did you have, am I right in saying that you had charges brought against you as a result of the activity? Yeah, that's right. Um, so this hap So the performance took... Uh, um, part in early March. In late December, I came home and there was a police card in my front door um, asking me to call them. And I, to be honest, had no idea what it was about. I assumed the neighbours had probably been broken into or something. And so when I called and asked the police officer what it was about and he said, yeah, we've got a summons here for you. Even then I thought, have I got an unpaid parking fine? But no, they decided to charge me um, with the offence of not complying with the permit I for the stage being moved onto the lagoon. To this day, I don't know why it took them so long to lay those charges. I can only assume that they thought we had something big coming up for the following year and it was a warning for me not to do it. I also think they probably assumed that I would just accept the charges, go to court, plead guilty, get a fine and that would be that. But they didn't factor in me getting the assistance of the one and only Daniel Beecher of Phoenix Legal Solutions. This is a little plug. Um, who does a lot of pro bono work, as you would know, Siobhan, for animals and for the duck rescue team in Victoria. And Daniel was fabulous and he basically, you know, with his assistance, uh, when we finally got to court um, six months later... The Parks and Wildlife um, uh, defence, uh, sorry, um, team didn't put any evidence, didn't submit any evidence, and so the case was dismissed. Well, there you go. So, Yvette, 
Why use art as a form of, I guess, advocacy or kind of education on animal issues? Yeah, that's a really good question, Siobhan. It's something, because I've got a background as an animal rights activist, it is something that's crossed my mind, of course, a lot of times. What's the, mo- what's the most effective way to advocate for animals? Um, and I suppose, as far as I can see, there are many, many ways of doing it. It's often quite blurry when you look at the creativity that goes into a lot of animal campaigns anyway. They're often very creative in and of themselves. So, in a way, as an artist, you're still playing into that thing of going, how can I creatively address these issues and bring them to the public attention? I think where art comes into play is that it can do it in ways that um, are less confronting. So, not using graphic imagery necessarily. They cap- it captures the imagination and that's what I would argue was the real success of Duck Lake. It really captured people's imagination and the media response to that um, project was incredible. So, although we only had the one TV crew up there, all of the other TV stations um, got the footage from ABC. So, it went on. There are three local television stations. Um, it was on every news bulletin. It was on um, ABC TV in Victoria as well. It was in all of the local papers and it was syndicated throughout Australia through Murdoch Press. And even in um, subsequent years, images from Duck Lake are still used when there's a story around duck shooting in in Tasmania. Mm, yeah, it's quite something, isn't it? So, Yvette, beyond being someone who's interested in animal issues and an artist, you're also a scholar, you are a researcher and you work at the University of Tasmania. How do you bring all those aspects of your life together? Do they all come together smoothly in lots of different ways or are there is a bit of tension there between these various elements? There are tensions, absolutely there are tensions. I mean, it's partly about just simply trying to fit everything in to life. It's difficult. Uh, and the thing that tends to suffer is my art practice. Um, and in fact, the Duck Lake Project was the last big art project that I did and we're talking sort of you know we're coming up for four years ago now um in fact over four years ago uh and although you know there has been a um an, an artwork that came of that which has had a life being exhibited in um I think it was at three or four different exhibitions now it's really difficult to find a, a way of fitting all of those things in but what I will say is that There's no conflict whatsoever between animal studies and my artwork because they're one and the same thing. I do have other research projects that I get involved in that aren't um, necessarily directly related to the visual arts, although most of my academic writing is. Um, But as you would know, there's a survey of animal studies scholars that that I worked on with both yourself and Fiona Probe and Rapsy. So uh, those sorts of... Um, areas of scholarship is something that I, I have the opportunity to get involved in as well. Um, it's also been so – I'm quite proud of the fact that um, I've been able to get animal studies up as an area of strategic research uh, at the University of Tasmania. And although, you know, we're a small university and there's a relatively small number of animal scholars, it is actually taken seriously – um, enough by the College of Arts, Law and Education where my school is located um, that it was one of, um, I think there were 39 submissions and 13 or expressions of interest and only 13 of those got up as areas of strategic research. So I was really pleased that Animal Studies was one of them. Wonderful. So you're somebody who has been involved in Animal Studies, you know, for a long time uh, as I have and I think we've both watched the field grow and develop. It strikes me that creative works of art have been an important part of animal studies for a long time and that kind of seems to be increasing and continuing. Is that, do you have a view on that, how art fits into animal studies more generally? Oh, I think you're right. You know, I think the visual arts, the crea- I'd say the creative arts in general, but certainly the visual arts have had a really strong presence within animal studies and is absolutely, it's a growing 
um, present. So, I mean, I, I even find that in terms of the number of inquiries that I get for people wanting to do um, honours and postgraduate degrees um, who have an animal studies theme to their work, um, there's more and more of those coming through. Um, I can't even remember now. In the last probably four or five years, I've probably examined at least half a dozen um, postgraduate submissions in the visual arts with an animal studies focus. And I think it is one of the things I really love about animal studies is just that it incorporates so many different approaches, so many different disciplines. And for the most part, it's an incredibly uncompetitive field. People genuinely enjoy um, the, the variety of scholarship that goes on and there are some really fruitful um, collaborations that have come from people working across different disciplines. Mm. Well, Yvette, I ask everyone who comes on the podcast to answer quick questions. Because you're a returning guest, you have four quick questions to answer. Are you ready for your four quick questions? I think so. <laughs> What's been the most satisfying or rewarding aspect of conducting animal studies research? I think it's actually just seeing the growth of the field. I guess I remember very clearly going to the first animals, Australian Animal Studies Conference in Perth in 2005 and I think there were about 60 people at that conference. And I was there. That You were indeed. And the field has just, as you know, has grown so much in that time and so quickly. And there are new people coming to the field all the time. Um, and I think both the, the variety and the quality of the scholarship is incredible in the field. I think it's some, one of the most exciting fields of scholarship to be involved in. Wonderful. So what's been the most challenging or disheartening aspect of being an animal studies scholar? There are certainly challenges. I think on a personal level, I haven't found those to be challenges. It's been a fairly straightforward thing to be able to incorporate into my research. On another level, I think the most challenging thing is to be able to get it up as um, in, in terms of sort of more formal courses or units of study. That's something I've really struggled with. It's very difficult for me to incorporate very much into my teaching as a visual artist other than in a fairly peripheral way. That's still a difficult thing to sort of get happening. Um, I don't know, maybe that will change, but at the moment sort of, you know, we have no formal courses of study in animal studies at the University of Tasmania, for example. But mm. Well, Yvette, this is your opportunity to give a shout out to an animal studies scholar. Uh, it should be someone that you'd like to make listeners aware of. It could be someone who is an emerging scholar. It could be someone who you think hasn't received the recognition they deserve. Perhaps they're from the global south or working in a language other than English. Who would you like to give a shout out to? I'm actually going to say Annie Potts. And the reason I say Annie is far, she's far from emerging. She's been there right from the beginning. And Annie, along with Philip Armstrong, um, are co-directors of the New Zealand Centre for Human Animal Studies, and I'm actually going to give a shout out because I think the work that Annie and Philip really have done has been really under-recognised in terms of the, um, you know, being so instrumental to the movement developing, being somewhere that's seen as fairly remote as New Zealand. Um, the fact that they got up the first ever PhD in animal studies in the Southern Hemisphere, if not the world. Um, and the one thing I'll say of Annie is that she is such an incredibly supportive person she really does a lot of work apart from in scholarship in terms of um, assisting other scholars um, in their work. And I think that goes really under-recognised, that it's not just about Annie getting her own work out there, but the work she does in helping others. Yes, hear, hear. Big shout out to Annie, one of our best people, and Philip, of course. So, are you optimistic about the future of human-non-human -human animal relationships? That's a really vexed question. I suspect most people feel like there are kind of yes and no's to that. Some days I think it's really positive when I look at the growth of veganism um, and even with the big protests um, around Australia recently, the Dominion protests, although the, there was, you know, they got a lot of criticism, I was surprised actually at, at how nuanced some of the discussions were in the general media. 
Um, and in that respect, I feel like given how long I've been around and, you know, working in animal advocacy since the mid-80s, I don't think I could have imagined back in the mid-80s that we would have seen such a rapid growth in veganism. On the other hand, you know, I feel like every time we take a couple of steps forward, humans have this incredible ability to come up with some other, you know, vile and selfish, exploitative way of um, causing harm to animals um, and, you know, furthering that kind of supremacist idea that treats animals as just commodities and something we just have a right to do what we want to and with. But overall, I'm an optimist rather than a pessimist and I feel like we are actually making um, some really good inroads at the moment. Well, that's wonderful to hear. Well, Yvette, what are you working on next? Apart from working on trying to work out how to take my long service leave so that I can get my art practice back on track, I'm working on the next animal study survey with yourself and Fiona. So I hope people will be looking out for that in um, sometime in early 2020 because um, we certainly want as many responses as we can get. Um, but I'm also working on a really fabulous project called Octolab. Um, and I, uh, we've got a great website actually um, and it's OKTO hyphen lab.org and that's a co-curated exhibition with my German colleagues um, Andre Kreber, Anna Hulk and uh, Micah Riedinger from uh, Germany, uh, University of Kassel and Anna is an independent curator from Berlin and with my colleague at UTAS, Toby Julef. Um and so Octolab is bringing together artists, writers and scientists um, to work around um, the octopus as, a, as an animal and an extraordinary animal. So there'll be two exhibitions, one in Hobart in December this year, December, January, and then one in Germany in mid next year. Um, and we're hoping to get a, um, a book out, which will be a kind of part book, part catalogue as well. So lots going on there. Wonderful. Well, Yvette, be, beyond the Octolab uh, website, how else can people find out more about your work? Yes, uh, it wouldn't be handy if I could say, yes, go to yvettewatt.com and there would be an amazing website. <laughs> but there isn't. So I don't know, Siobhan, <laughs> Google me. <laughs> Work it out yourselves, basically. <laughs> and if anybody would like to volunteer to get my website going, that would be fabulous. Well, Yvette, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. Now, you can actually follow us. We're a little bit organised over at the old Knowing Animals HQ. You can follow us on Twitter at Knowing underscore Animals. You can like us on Facebook at Knowing Animals. You can also follow me on Facebook at Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan or on Twitter at Knowing underscore um, at SO underscore S. We've also got an Instagram account. And perhaps most importantly, don't forget to leave a review on iTunes because reviews make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals.